Good evening, everyone. My name is Rachel Cass, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this evening's event with the legendary John Lithgow, who will be discussing his new memoir, Drama and Actor's Education. Mr. Lithgow is an award-winning actor whose career has led him from the summer stock stage to a Gilbert and Sullivan production here at Harvard to successful stints on Broadway and in film and television. Among his many and varied roles, he has played Roberta Muldoon in The World According to Garp, Dick Solomon in Third Rock from the Sun, the truly terrifying Arthur Mitchell on the television series Dexter, and the voices of Lord Farquaad in Shrek and Yoda in the NPR adaptations of Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. Mr. Lithgow's first memoir, Drama, begins with his first appearance on stage at the age of two, holding his father's hand while dressed as a street urchin in a production of The Emperor's New Clothes. From there, it chronicles his childhood moving back and forth across the country, following his actor-director father's many exploits, uh, through his ultimate decision to pursue acting as a vocation as opposed to just a diversion. A review of the book in the New York Times calls Mr. Lithgow a mature memoirist and calls the book a buoyant, heartwarming account of coming into one's own. After the talk this evening, we will have time for questions from the audience. If you have a question, I ask that you come forward and speak it into this microphone in the center aisle. Um, this event is being recorded, so for that reason and for the sake of those around you, uh, we ask that you take a moment to turn off or silence your cell phones or other electronic devices. Um, we will conclude the evening with a signing here at the front of the hall. I will ask that after the event is over, you proceed to the back of the hall and form a signing line down this aisle to your left. Um, you will be able to purchase copies of drama at the top of the line. Please note that due to time constraints, Mr. Lithgow will only be signing copies of his new book, Drama, this evening. Um, and in addition, we will not be able to accommodate posed photographs at the signing table. Um, so we apologize for that. But it's going to be a great event anyway, so now please join me in welcoming John Lithgow. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm delighted to sell out a church. <laughs> I'm not sure I've ever done that before. I'm very pleased, but a little ambivalent. Feels a little sacrilegious. But thank you all for coming. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. And thank you, Rachel, for that introduction, even though I couldn't quite hear it. There's a Rosh Hashanah smorgasbord right behind that door. Uh, they're raising quite a ruckus. Uh, I thought this evening I would uh, just tell you a little bit about the genesis of my book, uh, read a little bit of the uh, preface to just flesh that out, and then since we're here in Cambridge, I thought I'd read you a passage about my college days here at Harvard. It's a nice thing about doing a book tour and going around the country, I can t uh, select passages from the book that actually uh, grew out of my experiences in those places. There have been a lot of them. Uh, this book, there was actually an inciting incident that began the journey that finally led me to this completed book. It took place in September of 2002. Uh, at that time, my father was 86 years old, and he was recovering from uh, a kind of brutal operation, especially brutal for an old man. Uh, and he, my father had always been a, a genial man with a sly humor and a big boisterous laugh, but this operation completely knocked his pins out, weakened him terribly, slowed him way down. And its worst effect was it just took away his spirit. He was deeply depressed and kind of stonily silent. And my mother was struggling to take care of him. The two of them were living alone with no one looking after them. So I, I moved in with my parents for a month to help my mother nurse my dad back to, back to health and back to good humor and to arrange for some kind of home care for them. That month turned out to be really one of the most significant months in my life taking care of my father as an old man. 
I saw immediately that my main number one job was simply to cheer him up. He'd lost his will to live, and I saw that without the will to live, he was just not going to survive. He was too old and too weak. So I set about just trying to, trying to bring a little sunshine. I tried every strategy I could. I coaxed him into crosswords and word games. I, uh, I stumped him on Shakespeare, one of his areas of great expertise. I coaxed him to tell sunny stories about his young years, and just anything to cheer him up, but nothing worked. Uh, he sort of gamely went along with all this, but none of it could pull him out of this deep, dark depression. Then I had this bright idea about halfway through my time with him and my mom. I decided to read them bedtime stories. I found this book in their dusty bookcases. It's called Tellers of Tales, this old volume, uh, a, a volume containing 100 short stories edited by Somerset Maugham. And uh, can we get you a seat somewhere, sir? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> and uh, it was a book that my father used to use to read bedtime stories to me and my siblings when we were little children. And that evening when they were all tucked in, my mother in their big 60-year-old bed and my father in his little rented hospital bed drawn up next to hers, I sprung my surprise. I showed him this book and I told him to pick a story. He picked a story called Uncle Fred Flits By by P.G. Woodhouse. And as soon as he picked it, I, I recognized the title, although I didn't really remember the story. All I remembered was that it was one of our absolute favorites when we were children because it was so damn funny. So I started reading it to him. And it went off like, like a firecracker in my hands. It was spectacularly funny. It was one of the best pieces of comedy writing I'd ever read. And as I read it, more and more of it came back to me. Uh, the characters revealed themselves and the complications kicked in and one by one, I recognized all those things that we thought were so funny all those years ago. And about halfway through the story, my father started to laugh. It was kind of gurgly, helpless laugh almost in spite of himself. It was like the engine of an old car starting up after years of disuse. I kept reading and he kept laughing louder and louder until he was almost out of breath. It was just the most wonderful sound. And I had the sense that it was some time during the reading of that story that my father came back to life. Now, I want you to bear that in mind while I read just the end of the preface of the book, the beginning of the preface, preface tells us an expanded version of what I've just told you. Acting is nothing more than storytelling. An actor usually performs for a crowd, whether for a hundred people in an off-Broadway theater or for millions of moviegoers all over the globe. Reading to my parents on that autumn evening in Amherst was something else again. It was acting in its simplest, purest, most rarefied form. My father was listening to Uncle Fred flits by as if his life depended on it. And indeed it did. The story was not just diverting him, it was easing his pain, dissolving his fear, and leading him back from the brink of death. It was rejuvenating his atrophied soul. Lying next to him, my mother could sense that by some mysterious force, her husband was returning to her. Before he went to sleep, Dad thanked me for the story as if I'd given him a treasured gift. But he'd given me a gift, too. It was the gift of a father's love. I was 56 years old and had known him all my life. 
In all those years, our relationship had changed kaleidoscopically. We had been up and down, happy and sad, close and distant. Our fortunes had risen and fallen, ebbed and flowed, rarely at the same time. But in all those years, I'd never felt as close to him, nor ever felt as much love for him as I did that night. He had given me another gift, too, although he never lived to see it bear fruit. The period I spent with my parents was one of the most significant in my life. In that memorable month, that Woodhouse story was the most memorable hour. I had spent my entire adult life acting in plays, movies, and television shows. I had told stories. I'd had a gratifying, fun, and prosperous career. Only infrequently had I paused to plumb the mysteries of my peculiar occupation. That night, however, everything came into focus. Sitting at my parents' bedside and reading them a story, trying to help two old people feel better, came to seem like a distillation of everything my profession is about. In the years to come, my thoughts kept returning to that evening, even after my father was long gone. Finally, spurred on by the events of that night, I decided to write this book. That's just the preface. <laughs> All the good stuff comes later. There was, uh, then there was an intervening stage between that night and this night. I, I felt that night that I had discovered, I discovered an incredible piece of material to perform on stage. It was Uncle Fred Flitz by. I thought, man, I can really delight people with this. I could delight you with it right now. <laughs> I decided to memorize it and sort of try it out on people with a sort of vague notion of doing a solo performance of it. I memorized it sort of paragraph by paragraph while I was walking my dog every morning and every evening. One paragraph per dog walk. And I just, just memorized and memorized, and after about a month, I could recite the entire 45, 50-minute story, start to finish, and my dog was exhausted. <laughs> and I contacted Jack O'Brien, a good friend and a wonderful director, and told him about my notion of doing this as a show. We contacted Andre Bishop, good Harvard man, who now runs the the Lincoln Center Theater Company in New York, and pitched the notion of doing a workshop of this. Uh, we asked him just to give us a, a rehearsal room so that I could invite 20 friends or so, and I could simply perform it for them and see, see how it felt, try it on for size, and we did that. And it was a wonderful, memorable afternoon. I spent about five minutes, maybe, telling them my history of the story, pretty much what I've told you tonight, but a much shorter version. And then I performed Uncle Fred for them. They loved the story. It was a great discovery for them, as it had been for me, a rediscovery. But they really loved my little five-minute introduction. They wanted to hear more of that. Now, I'd never, I'd never had the nerve to write anything from my own experience for myself to perform. But Andre, Jack, and my friends emboldened me. Uh, we, the, uh, my little performance for them had taken about 45, 50 minutes. He said, well, that's not enough for an evening of the theater. You've got to make it about 90 minutes long. If you can do that, then you can have the Mitzi Newhouse Theater on dark nights all spring. I'll give you 14 evenings to perform the show. So I set about to expand upon it, to write a little bit about my father, to write about his mother, my grandmother, uh, who was an amazing storyteller. Uh, I turned it into a performable evening, and it was a wonderful mini-success at the Mitzi Newhouse. Very few performances in a very small house. It was impossible to get a ticket. It was the biggest little hit in New York that <laughs> spring. That was the spring of 2008. And among the people who did get in to see it was people from HarperCollins, and they prevailed on me to at least consider writing a memoir. Now, 
This I had never dreamed of doing. Uh, I thought it was a little too showy. But after all, I was showing off like crazy every night all by myself. So I said yes and set about to, re to, to write my own story. Uh, I don't know how many of you have written a memoir. It's a very difficult thing to do. If it's an easy thing to do, it probably is a lousy memoir. Uh, for one thing, you really do have to create an overarching theme for yourself and you have to try to write something meaningful. You have to fill your story with characters who are more interesting than you yourself are. And, and I set off writing, sort of very unsure of myself. It was like setting off to swim across an ocean, not really knowing what route I was going to take uh, and thinking I would never get to the other side. The process of writing began to suggest the theme to me. I began to realize, as I say in the, in the, in the preface, I am a storyteller. An actor is a storyteller. It became a meditation on what I do, uh, why I act, why people watch, why we all want, need, and love stories. Uh, these are questions that I put forth in the book and attempt to answer them. There are no clear answers to those questions. It's a mystery. But that's what my book is about. It's about the making of me as an actor, but the gradual accumulation of a sense of myself and what it is that I do. Uh, it's also simply my own history, only up to the year 1980. It's the story of a young actor's education. Uh, and I touch on all sorts of kind of vivid interludes in my life. There are few, few are more vivid than my days at Harvard. So I'm going to read you a little bit about that. As I think Rachel told you in, in the introduction, as you listen to me, think about questions you'd like to ask me, okay? And you can ask me about anything at all, uh, except perhaps, you know, what was it like working with Robin Williams? <clears throat> <laughs> <clears throat> this uh, chapter, I'm just going to read sort of a cutting of it. It's called Utopia. I'm going to have a little water first. That was my water falling on the ground, that big clunk. So nice to see all you good Cambridge faces. <laughs> <clears throat> this is actually the second chapter on Harvard. Within weeks of my arrival in Cambridge, the floodgates had opened, and I was swept into the world of Harvard undergraduate drama. Days after that first visit to the Loeb, I auditioned for the first big main stage show of the year and landed a major role in it. I was to be Reverend Anthony Anderson one of the two rival leading men in Shaw's The Devil's Disciple. My father had played Dick Dudgeon, the other leading man, back in Oak Bluffs when I was five years old. I grew up in a theater family, you see. You have to read the book. <laughs> I was the only freshman in the show, and as I rehearsed with the rest of the cast in the basement of the Loeb, I keenly felt my rookie status. I was an unlicked whelp among a lot of swaggering juniors and seniors, the youngest actor playing the oldest of the major roles. But my years of experience fortified me. In rehearsals, I held my own, and in performance, I was self-assured and commanding. The joke went around that in three, year, three more years, I'd be running the place. As it happened, my Harvard years were the most active and creative of my life. The fact that there was no academic program in theater meant that all of us operated in an atmosphere of reckless, unsupervised, creative abandon. It was the last time I worked in the theater for the pure, unfettered joy of it. Some of the work was excellent, much of it was dreadful, but its quality was never really the point. Joy was the point. If someone wanted to try something, there was somewhere to do it, a starvation-level budget to pay for it, and an entire army of eager classmates ready to join in. 
These were smart young kids, brilliant students of science, math, economics, political science, you name it. Only a tiny fraction of them ever dreamed of actually pursuing a life in the creative arts. They were merely looking for an outlet, a social context, and a little fun outside the demands of a Harvard undergraduate education. And yet hundreds of them spent more than half their waking hours feverishly slaving away as stagehands, set builders, costumers, lighting technicians, musicians, designers, producers, directors, and yes, actors, on one of the 50-odd shows which at any given moment were in various stages of production on that vast, sprawling campus. I'm sure some of you were there. To illustrate the variety and creative ferment of those Harvard years, here in a rough chronology is a sampling of my extracurricular entanglements there. I played the title roles in Tartuffe, Macbeth, Christopher Marlowe's Edward II, and Lord Byron's Manfred. I bet you've never seen that one on stage. I played the ancient, blinded Duke of Gloucester in King Lear. I was 18 at the time and wore a wig once worn by Sir John Gilgood. <laughs> I directed and acted in a one-act play by Moliere called The Forced Marriage. I also designed the set and created masks for all the characters. As president of the Gilbert and Sullivan Society, I directed and played the learned judge and the Lord Chancellor in Trial by Jury and Iolanthe, respectively. I recruited dancers from the Boston Conservatory and staged a double bill of one-act opera ballets made up of Stravinsky's Renard and Renati's The Unicorn, The Gorgon, and The Manticore. I made the masks for that one, too. I directed, designed, and played the role of the devil in a fully staged version of Stravinsky's L'Histoire du Soldat. In a Radcliffe College common room, I recited Dylan Thomas's poetic reminiscence, A Child's Christmas in Wales. Beside me, a Radcliffe girl in a black leotard, future actress Lindsay Krauss, did a Jules Pfeiffer-esque dance interpretation of the entire piece. With a few ringers from the New England Conservatory of Music, I staged Mozart's Le Nozze di Figaro in a dorm dining room. The conductor, the conductor grew up to be the Pulitzer Prize winning composer, John Adams. I played the role of Sparky in Sergeant Musgrave's dance by John Arden. The title role was played by a student from Texas, a year younger than I, named Tommy Lee Jones. I directed John Gay's The Beggar's Opera in yet another dining hall. The orchestra's harpsichord was played by future world-class conductor William Christie, and the cast included a talented, bawdy young actress named Stockard Channing. I designed the sets for Sean O'Casey's The Plow and the Stars, though in truth they were the ugliest, most ungainly sets ever seen on the main stage of the Loeb Drama Center. I designed and directed an elaborate production of George Buchner's Wojciech at the Loeb. This is a dark, expressionistic German work seething with hot-blooded sex, sulfurous jealousy, and murderous vengeance. Although I was a senior by this time and 21 years old, I didn't have a clue about even the most basic of these primal human emotions. <laughs> but more on that particular blind spot later. <laughs> and what about my actual Harvard education? As a student, let's just say I was a very good actor. Concurrently with all of my frenzied extracurricular exploits, I managed to fake my way through my studies. I had chosen an extremely rigorous major, English history and literature. This was an academic field packed with star professors and driven, high-powered students. Although I never completed the reading for a single class and sat mute through most classroom discussions, no, nobody seemed to notice what a plodding intellectual slowpoke I was. Oh, but I was crafty. A prime example of my craftiness was a, quote, independent study I cobbled together for course credit. It focused on London in the 18th century, taking Daniel Defoe's Journal of the Plague Year as its central text. To my shame, I never even read the book. 
My one-on-one -on -one teacher was an amiable young assistant professor named David Sachs. The course consisted of three or four pleasant conversations in his office, spread over an entire semester. <laughs> in years to come, Sachs would achieve a distinguished career in academia. I ran into him by chance a few years ago, and he gently reminded me that I still owed him a paper. But despite my academic sleight of hand, my distracted brain managed to absorb great swatches of knowledge. Most of my professors were grizzled old superstars of the Harvard firmament who had long since learned how to put on a great show. Lecturing for as many as 600 students at a time, they were masters at conveying and inspiring a genuine passion for their various subjects. The names of these venerable men barely register now. But in those days, they were spoken of around Harvard with solemn reverence. I learned the Homeric epics from John Finley, the history of drama from William Alfred, romantic poetry from Walter Jackson Bate, art history from Seymour Slive, a smattering of psychology from Eric Erickson, and on and on and on. And if I did the least possible amount of studying to get by, get by, I did. I never got less than a C, and I only got one of those. I wrote a 60-page honors thesis on satire in restoration comedy. I graduated magna cum laude, and I was one of a handful of my classmates indu inducted into Phi Beta Kappa. On the day I graduated, I secretly felt as if I'd gotten away with murder. <laughs> Now, I've got about three more pages. Shall I go on? Oh, yeah, okay. Yes. Of course, what are you going to say? <laughs> <clears throat> so in this whirlwind of grinding academics and amateur theatrics, when did I decide to embrace my destiny and become a professional actor? I can narrow it down to a minute-long span of time late one evening in December of 1964. It happened like this. From that long list of student productions from my four years at Harvard, I've left one title out. It is Utopia Limited, or The Flowers of Progress, an 1893 operetta by Gilbert and Sullivan, an epic-sized and overdrawn satire of British colonialism on a South Sea island. Utopia Limited is the least known and least performed of the entire GNS canon. It is a raucous, vaguely racist piece of work that probably deserves its obscurity, but in my own modest history, it looms large. Although an unlikely candidate for a life-altering experience, Utopia Limited was the show that distinctly altered my life. Early in the autumn of my sophomore year, a production of the operetta was slated for the main stage of the Loeb Drama Center. Its director was an intense and brilliant young man named Timothy S. Mayer. As seductive as he was abrasive, Tim Mayer was one of the most extraordinary characters I've ever known, and he looked the part. He was stoop-shouldered and pocky, with a rope of dark brown hair always hanging in front of his piercing, bespectacled gray eyes. He sported expensive tweeds and penny loafers, but the clothes hung shabbily on him, and he wore no, no socks. He spoke in a language all his own, rapid fire and dazzlingly clever. A heavy drinker, a non-stop smoker, he was a man whose prodigious talent was matched by an equally prodigious strain of self-destructiveness. During his Harvard career, he would churn out a long string of electrifying productions, but he never scaled the same heights in the hazardous world of professional theater. As if consumed by his own demons, he died tragically young of cancer in his early 30s. By a quirk of fate, this amazing young man was to have a catalytic, catalytic effect on the next several years of my life. Of the many shows Tim directed at Harvard, Utopia Limited was its, his maiden effort. He was fiercely determined to make a splash with it and to disprove the old adage that Gilbert and Sullivan is more fun to perform than to actually watch. His take on it was startlingly original. 
In W.S. Gilbert's creaky, campy Victorian humor, he saw hidden strains of bitter, almost savage anti-imperialism. For all its high spirits, this was to be the thrust of his production. He pitched it on a grand scale with an enormous cast, a 30-piece orchestra, and lavish pastel-colored costumes and sets. But as Tim conceived it, all of this extravagance was shot through with acid irony. He had joined forces with Gilbert to skewer Victorian smugness and arrogance 70 years after the fact. With the bravura that would soon earn him the nickname the Barnum of Brattle Street, Tim touted Utopia Limited accurately as the biggest spectacle yet produced at the Loeb. All fall was abuzz with breathless rumors of this magnum opus. But perilously late in the rehearsal period, the production was dealt a crippling blow. The actor playing the central comic role of King Paramount, ruler of the island nation of Eulalica, abruptly walked off the show. Suddenly, this colossal enterprise had no leading man, and Tim Mayer, a frazzled director at the best of times, was desperate for a replacement. By now, my performances in Shakespeare, Marlowe, and Shaw had accorded me an embryonic star status in the tiny world of Harvard Theater, so Tim sought me out. The phone rang in my dorm room. I answered. Mincing no words, he got right to the point. Can you sing? <laughs> I'd never sung on stage in my life, and I told him so. But I knew plenty of songs. And so a half hour later, I was standing on the stage of the Loeb, belting out an a cappella version of an English music hall song titled, I Live in Trafalgar Square. I sung the last note and stared out into the house. With a shout, Tim cast me on the spot. And that evening, I walked into my first rehearsal, leaping onto the speeding train known as Utopia Limited. In the run-up to our first performance, I was rushed through a kind of musical theater boot camp. I was spoon-fed my recitatives and arias. I was drilled on the bass line of all the four parts singing. I, even sent, I was even sent downtown to the New England Conservatory for a few last-minute voice lessons. Ideally, the role of King Paramount should be sung in a big, resounding bass. For all my efforts, I never got beyond a thin, reedy baritone. And over the years, I haven't improved much on that. But my pitch was reliable, every word was crystal clear, and I strove to squeeze every drop of wit out of Gilbert's lyrics. And in all the book scenes, on much firmer ground, I was effortlessly funny. As rehearsals sped by in the countdown to our opening night, I methodically proceeded, scene by scene, to steal the show. <laughs> Act Two of Utopia Limited begins with a comic septet, taking its title from the first line, Society Has Now Forsaken All Its Wicked Courses. This number is sung by all of the principal men in the cast. As the plot unfolds, the island nation is transformed in an, into an absurd Polynesian parody of English society. The song's verses, sung by King Paramount, provide a long list of examples of that transformation. The verses are broken up by a snappy refrain sung at top speed by all seven men. It really is surprising what a thorough anglicizing we have brought about. Utopia is quite another land. In our enterprising movements, we are England with improvements which we dutifully offer to our motherland. The format of the septet is that of an English music hall minstrel show with the seven men in white tie and tails seated on seven chairs. King Paramount in the middle. Every time the refrain is repeat, repeated, the men leap to their feet, producing all manners of instruments. As the song builds, so does the loopy energy of the singers. The lyrics are funny enough, but the theatrics of the staging make the number over-the-top hilarious. By tradition, it is such a hit that the seven singers plan a couple of encores just in case they're needed, ready to perform ever more elaborate variations on that manic refrain. Our production was no exception. All eight times we performed the song, we stopped the show with it. But for me, the first time was the life changer. That night, when the song proper came to an end, the applause was deafening. 
We all remained on stage, poised for our first encore. The conductor powered up the orchestra again, silencing the crowd. I repeated the last verse, and the seven of us bellowed the refrain. This time I did a frenzied mock tap dance with one of the men tapping, rapping on the stage floor at my feet with a pair of drumsticks. This brought an even bigger response from the crowd. Once again we stayed on stage and once again we performed an encore. For this one I produced three Spaldines, spray painted gold, and juggled them inanely all through the refrain. An even bigger response. By now the crowd was delirious. We had only plotted the two encores, so the other six men picked up their instruments and chairs and walked into the wings. I remained on stage alone, <laughs> ready to begin the next scene. But the audience did not stop applauding. The applause swelled into cheers. The cheers became a roar. I suppose the ovation must have lasted about 20 seconds. <laughs> but to me, it seemed five minutes at the very least. I stood there, grinning like an idiot, <laughs> dizzy with the overdose of adulation pouring down on me. That 20 seconds was all it took. There was no longer any question. I was going to be an actor. <laughs> so. Well, thank you. Hey. <laughs> I recognize that sound. <laughs> now, I hope you've thought of some questions, and I'll try to think of some answers. Anybody want to raise your hand? Don't be shy. Yes? Yeah, you can just line up if you like. Yes? Thank you so much for your selected readings tonight. Um, as you began on this amazing career after your clearly glorious performance in Utopia Limited, <laughs> did you have a comprehensive awareness of what your skills were as an actor, or did you discover those later as you progressed along your career? Well, that's a, that's a good question. I, I, I had certainly had a lot of positive reinforcement even that young. I sort of knew I, I could handle myself and I could work an audience. Uh, I sort of knew I was good and I was cocky and I was confident. But the great thing about my career, and I, I write about it in the book, is all the best things that came to me, the best roles and the most surprising performances were things I never thought I could do, the things that I never imagined myself doing. Uh, and that's, for, at, on the very most basic level, I thought I would only work in American repertory theater. My father was a theater manager in regional theater, and that was my world, and I assumed that's what I would keep doing. I never thought I would be on Broadway. I never thought I would be in a movie. And I certainly never thought I would do six years on a sitcom on television. <laughs> I, you know, so... <laughs> I mean, if you're a very lucky actor, things come along and surprise you. But it, it took me way, way out of my sense of myself in those days. Thank you. Thank you. Hi there. So I loved your little story of moving back home. So I moved back home at 27, and I moved out a month ago at 35. <laughs> and my father, I, I, I knew everything about my mother at 18 that I still know, but 99% of the stuff I know about my father is from this later lifetime, spending time with him. So. Over the years after you decided to be an actor to as things became happening or started happening, are there, can you share some stories of what your father with all this history in the, in the field would have told you along the way and mm -hmm. what are some of your favorite stories? Well, uh, moments as, with him? as you can imagine, there's a huge amount of that in the book. It, it, the book I regard as m m almost a co 
biography of myself and my father. Uh, I, I so appreciate and identify with you. Uh, I feel so grateful that I spent that month with my parents in the very last chapter of my father's life because it was, I, I did get to know him better during that month than I had in the preceding 85 years. I mean, I should say the preceding 56 years. Um, and, and I think I talk to young people, I, I talk to any, anybody, I say, if you, if you ever have the choice, go to your parents when they need you at the end of their lives. It, it, was, I, it was as important an experience for me as it was for them. Because my father was a reticent man. He was, he was a, a terrific man of the theater. He was very bold on stage, and he was a kind of captivating and charismatic theater manager. But he was as many theater people are, he was, he was quite reserved about his own emotional life. And I speculate about that in the book, whether or not that is a valid generalization for people who seek out a career in entertainment. To what degree do we connect with an audience because of the difficulty we have connecting one-on-one -on -one with other people? Um, I think this is extraordinarily true of, of comedians. Uh, in my experience. But uh, as for my father, I would tell you more about him, but it's all in the book. <laughs> yes? I, I know you're a champion of arts and education with Arts First at Harvard and so forth, and I was wondering if you could just share a little story about how you kind of got that uh, off the ground and, and your, your thoughts about the future of kind of arts in public education. It seems to often be cut uh, yeah. when funding is, is a question. So just what, what were the successes of getting this launched at Harvard, and then what, what insights does that have for elsewhere? Well, thanks for asking. You may have noticed that I jumped forward in the chapter and, and skipped a couple of pages. Those were pages about arts first. As I tell my, the story of my young years, I frequently jump forward to things that happened in my later years, and I describe Arts First as my pride and joy. I mean, one of my proudest achievements. It, it took the, the, the germ of Arts First. I was on the Harvard Board of Overseers between 89 and 95, uh, elected with my portfolio was the overseers from the overseer from the arts. There hadn't been any overseer from the creative arts since Robert Frost in the 1930s. And I learned that Robert Frost himself only served for a year. He was so bored. <laughs> uh, so there I was hanging in there after about three years. I wasn't bored, but I wondered what in the world I was doing there. Uh, sort of in over my head, and then I it sort of concurrently with the arrival of Neil Rudenstein, who was an old friend of mine, as a, one of my tutors, as president, I began to assert myself as the overseer from the arts. I put forth a proposal to create an ad hoc committee on the arts of the overseers. We, I formed a little committee, I was the chair, and we wondered, well, what do we do? And I thought, well, let's have some kind of celebration of all this extraordinary undergraduate activity in the springtime when, it's, when everybody feels uh, that they're coming back to life. Um, and I spoke to Neil about it. Neil loved the idea. Neil himself told me to think bigger. And he said, what you need is a, a, basically a line producer, a kind of arts czar, and we already have one. We have the director of the Office of the Arts, Myra Maiman. So I called up Myra Maiman. I said, I've been told to start an arts festival. It was my idea, and Neil said yes. And Myra did a brilliant job of assembling an operating committee of about a dozen uh, professors, staff, and students, all ready to go. I mean, it was like an idea that it was just waiting to, to happen. And that was the, I believe, I'm not exactly sure, I think it was the summer of 19, uh, the spring of 1993, and we set about inventing traditions. Whoever gets the chance to do that? Almost everything that happens at Arts First every year is something we thought up that very first year. On a much smaller scale, of course, now it's just enormous. And I come back every spring and it's, 
I can't get through the year without it. it. It is so restorative to see all this incredible talent put to work. The whole subject of arts education in the schools, of course, is huge uh, and dire. And I, I can't help being hopeful. I'm an optimistic person. I write about that a good deal in the book, too. Uh, I just think the country is in, is in the midst of a trauma right now. Uh, and awful things happen at moments of economic crisis. Terrible things get sacrificed. People think that essential things are inessential, and I consider art in schools absolutely essential. Uh, and so, uh, you know, when I was growing up, I didn't want to be an actor. I wanted to be a painter and a printmaker. Uh, I was quite serious about it right up until Utopia Limited. Uh, I was in public school. I lived in eight or ten different towns growing up because of my father's peripatetic life and career. But it was always in public schools. In some of those public schools, I, the best teachers I had were the art teachers. Akron, Ohio. I had two years in the public schools where my first two periods of the day, out of only eight periods, were studio art classes. And I couldn't wait to get to school every morning. Art was like the booster rocket for the rest of my academic day. Uh, it was, and it's not just that it made it more fun. It made it more creative and alive, the whole idea of education. It wasn't drudgery. It wasn't test prep. I could, of course, go on, but I won't. But thanks for asking the question. Hi there. Um, so you're one of the few actors who's known equally well for comedic and serious performances. Do you feel more comfortable with one or the other? And with your less comfortable one, did you have some inspiration, some people who you looked up to? to no, I, I, you know, uh, the only time I'm uncomfortable as an, as an actor is when I have bad material. <laughs> You know, serious drama or wild comedy, it's down to the same thing. It has to be well-written. You have to have good writing, or it's really tough. And if it's good, then it's always easy, even when it's, even when it's exhausting and strenuous and difficult and torturous. It's still it's fun. The harder it is, the better if it's good. Uh, and as for the difference between comedy and drama, I just love going back and forth. I love upending people's expectations. The two most prominent things I've done on television were Third Rock from the Sun and Dexter. They couldn't possibly be more different. <laughs> and the, one of the reasons I think that tr the Trinity killer on Dexter was so p potent was that people's real familiarity with me was as this kind of daffy, ineffectual, clueless comic. Uh, it, it was just wonderful to take that preconception and turn it on its head and really, really scare people. <laughs> well, that's a good question. Thank you. Hi. Um, I had a similar question about um, favoritism in acting with genres, if there's any that you feel more drawn towards or in your acting education, if you found yourself challenging yourself with different roles, uh, what direction did you go in in college and uh, beyond? Well, I actually, my, the college days were a template for the rest of my career. I mean, the fact that I did Gilbert and Sullivan and Gloucester and King Lear, Tartuffe and Wojciech, you know, uh, I, I consider myself an equal opportunity entertainer. Uh, this is not even to mention the fact that I entertain little children, you know, with silly songs that, that are just for them. Adults aren't allowed into the room, you know. <laughs> uh, I just love the variety of it, and I love the variety of responses from the audience. Thank you. Sure. Hello. Hello. Um, usually every Friday I uh, leave my office, cross the street, go to South Station to buy a lottery ticket, and today I ran into you. And on the stairs I said, hey, I love your work, you're awesome. You were walking down the stairs. And what did I, I say? 
Uh, you didn't say anything because you were in a hurry. <laughs> I apologize. But I'm wondering, do you recall the first time some average run-of-the-mill person like me recognized you on the street? And how did it make you feel? Well, it's always a nice feeling. I, I mean, except in airports. Uh, that, you're always rushing somewhere in an airport, as apparently I was uh, in the subway. Uh, in general, people like you, it's a little expression of gratitude. And uh, just imagine what it's like to go through life getting like 50 of those little props a day. It's fabulous. If it didn't happen, I would sulk. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and as for... I don't know that I remember the very first time it happened, but there was a sort of, it was sort of purgatory when it all, it, when it didn't happen exactly right. Like, for example, the time the guy came up to me and said, uh, oh, who, who's that actor that everybody always tells you you remind them of? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, oh, it, 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 John Lithgow. And he said, no, no, not him. <laughs> Well, I, I'll tell I, you, you want to know, you want to hear my favorite story on this line, along this line, which puts everything in beautiful perspective. I, I assume most of you have seen the movie World According to Garp. Yes. There is the, do you remember the sublime opening credits with a little baby floating in the air to When I'm 64? Just an, the, the most beautiful opening credits. You know, with his little penis, and it, just, it was just so adorable. You couldn't wait to see the movie after those credits. Well, about five years later, I was in Scarsdale, New York, on location of all places, and I was, had my kids at the public pool, and this mother and father came up with this five-year-old boy and said, are you, are you the man from World According to Garp? And I said, yes, that was me. And they said, this is, this is Brandon. He's our son. He was the baby in the opening credits of The World According to Garp. I said, oh, this is amazing. Brandon, how, what a coincidence, incredible. And they, they turned to him and said, Brandon, this man was in your movie. <laughs> <laughs> so there you have it, you know. It's, it's a humbling profession. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. I, thank you. I, I, I think you're wonderful and thank awesome, you. and I do love your work. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. <laughs> Incidentally, I was nominated for an Oscar in GARP for Best Supporting Actor. <laughs> well, the baby was the one I was supporting, apparently. Well, uh, we see so many uh, one-hit wonders on TV and, and uh, on, on movies, uh, and, and you, you jumped from straight, I mean, not straight, but you jumped from, from a you know, a hit comedy show that was uh, several years uh, uh, on TV to, to Dexter that was a completely different uh, 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 environment. And, 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 uh, and uh, you see so many, so many actors that, you know, they're terrified of tap ca typecasting. And, and what do you think about, you know, like, uh, if, you, if you're extremely good in one thing, you're, you're, you're doomed to not work anymore, so how do you explain this? Well, the profession is, is tricky that way. I, I mean, it is hard to break the mold, and I have been lucky. I, I'll tell you, my, a lot of what you describe comes out of pure fear. Uh, I mean, I all, an actor is innately afraid that he'll never work again. It's an extraordinary thing. So my fortification for that is to constantly stay active and creative on my behalf, my own behalf. Always be doing something that I, that I own, you know. Uh, and it's, when Third Rock ended, Third Rock where I was on television once a week and everybody was recognizing me everywhere I went, that ended and I went straight back to New York theater, almost to go, go, uh, go back under the radar for a while and for a long while. Uh, don't, not even compete with people's strong image of me from Dick Solomon. You said I jumped from Third Rock from the Sun to Dexter. There was about 10 years in between. <laughs> people forget that. But that was by, it wasn't exactly by calculation, but it, there's a reason for that. They wouldn't have hired me for Dexter the, the year after I did uh, Third Rock from the Sun, and yet I was not going to wait around 10 years. 
for somebody to think of that. I was going to go right back to work. And the theater also makes, I mean, theater, for me, theater is at the heart of everything. I consider it my tap root, and it's always there. I, this, a couple of, about a month ago, for the new TV season, I was offered a replacement on an hour long, to replace the lead actor on an hour long drama series that had been on for many, many years. For a two year contract for gobs and gobs of money. And I turned it down like that because I'm all set to do a play in New York starting on March 1st uh, at the Manhattan Theater Club for equity minimum. I virtually have to pay to do it, but it's the best play I've read since M. Butterfly in 1988. So there's not anything that I'd rather do than that. And I, that's what I mean by sort of owning it. You know, you, you do what you truly want to do if you're lucky enough to have that luxury. Thank you for being here today. Um, really appreciate it. Uh, since I dare not ask my Robin Williams question, uh, I actually need to switch gears, and I'm going to ask you to expand on a point that you made earlier. Uh, I think that a lot of your fans really appreciate most your, uh, your range as an actor, and uh, from Dick Solomon to Arthur Mitchell, obviously quite a great range difference. Um, but I'm more interested in Arthur, Arthur Mitchell uh, and actually finding out a little bit more about the creative process that you followed to become so terrifying. Well, it, everything happens very briskly on television. I think I was hired to, to play the Trinity Killer only a couple of weeks before it started. Uh, we never rehearsed. I showed up and the very first thing I shot was the first scene of that season. And I don't know whether you remember that scene, but I was stark naked lying in a bathtub full of blood with a nude 18-year-old girl. Now, how much preparation can you do for that? <laughs> my, my preparation was to take all my clothes off and get right to work. I, I mean, it's, uh, it's an insane business. Uh, I will say I'm, do, I'm already doing a lot of preparation for this play in the spring doing a lot of reading because it's about a recent, not very well-known historical figure. So I, I need to find out everything I can about him and his demeanor, an actual person. So it varies. Sometimes you don't have a chance to, to do research even if you want to. Sometimes you have all, all the time in the world and you know you don't need it. In the case of the Trinity Killer, I knew all I had to do was look mean. Thank you. You bet. Hi there. Um, so my question is about the world according to Garp, mm -hmm. um, in which you did play a transgender character. Um, and it seems like even nowadays that's a type of role that most actors aren't um, brave enough or, or willing to try to perform. And I'm curious what it was that, about that character that, that kind of um, drew you to that particular role. I loved the character. I, I had read the book a couple of years before and I had loved Roberta Muldoon even in the book, in the novel. Uh, I didn't know they were going to make a movie of it. I didn't think they could make a movie of that book. But when I heard they did, I got a call from my agent saying that they wanted me to read for Garp. I thought, well, I, that's great, but I mean, what part? I'm too old for Garp. I'm, and my, my agent's assistant said, well, there's a typo on the casting sheet, but it says it's for the role of Roberta. And I thought, oh my God, of course. And I thought, that is my role. And I, abs I, I, I so wanted to play it, went to read for it, and I was not cast because I was too tall. It took eight months for George Roy Hill to come back and screen test me for it, oh, wow. <laughs> having seen about 100 people for the role. They even offered it to Kevin Klein, but when they did makeup tests, he looked just like a pirate. <laughs> so, so I got the part. <laughs> and you did a great justice, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. And let's make this the last one. I, Hi. Yes. Um, 
So it sounds like you had a very fruitful four years as a Harvard undergrad, but not necessarily because you were invested in academics. So I was um, wondering how, if your the academic degree that you received from Harvard, as it was English history and literature, you said, if that translated to anything else in your life, or if you really felt like it was something that you used later on. I, as oh, a, oh, I mean, I. Uh, I loved my studies, and, and they have stayed with me to an amazing degree. I'm amazed that I haven't forgotten more. Um, I'm a little hard on myself. Actually, rereading my book, I find that I'm quite hard on myself, uh, and I slightly amplify the fact that I sort of slipped through on my studies. I worked my ass off, uh, but I never felt that I was nearly as good a scholar as most of my classmates. The great insight was, that I arrived at was that that's pretty much the way all Harvard students feel. And then I felt a lot better. Um, but I'm, uh, there's another passage in the book. I hope I'm making you curious about the book. <laughs> but I write about the best art teacher I ever had, who was at the Art Students League in New York, very tough on me. And she said, it was a figure, nude figure drawing class, uh, when I was a senior in high school, she said, you have a, a great natural talent, a great facility, but your facility is your greatest asset and also your greatest weakness because it makes you ready, it makes you glib, it makes you willing to do, do less work. Uh, she said, art is hard. And when she said that to me, that has really stuck with me because I think, I think that characterizes me in a lot of areas of my life. I have ended up an actor, which is a very glib thing to do. Acting is not, it's creative on a, it's sort of second stage creative. It's acting out other people's visions, other people's, speaking other people's words. I don't, you know, I don't, I, I deeply respect acting, and I think it's a very serious pursuit. It's a great craft, but it's a glib craft. You have to come and just deliver. I'm really good at that. But I, it also, you know, most actors you'll find sort of swing back and forth between arrogance and self-contempt because they often have this sense that what they do is as I say, getting away with murder, that it's fooling people, that it's inessential, and that it's frivolous. Uh, I think it's important to acknowledge that and to say, well, yes, it is frivolous, but there's a great value to frivolity, too. So that's me. It almost defines me. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for coming to church. <laughs>